the first session of the 2020 Ohio Beef Cattle Nutrition and Management School was hosted by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team on January 29th in Woodville and repeated the following evening in Newark, Ohio. During that first session, Dr. Francis Fluharty, Ohio State University Professor Emeritus and current professor and head of the Department of Animal and Dairy Science at the University of Georgia, presented on the importance of feedlot bunk management, cost-effectively utilizing alternative feedstuffs, and considerations for including small grains and co-products in the ration. This is Dr. Fluharty's presentation. I'm going to talk about feeding high grain diets in general and then how we may or may not choose to incorporate small grains in cattle. Some important considerations to me. I'm just going to step over here. In feedlot profitability, we want to optimize feed efficiency. The reason we have feedlots is to add value to grain and grain byproducts through cattle. So the goal really is to put on the most pounds for the least amount of feed. Or another way to look at it on a pound basis, if I put on a pound of gain, I want to use as little feed as possible to put that on. In today's environment, we want to reduce antibiotic use. It improves quality grades if we handle cattle in non-stressful ways so that we don't need to use antibiotics, and it also reduces costs. A major component of any feedlot is minimizing acidosis, and I'm going to talk a lot about this. Diet formulation, management, the grains we choose that all can impact whether an animal becomes acidic or not. We want to optimize those cattle in the upper two-thirds of choice and prime grades. If you look at the premiums over the last year, there's a $20 choice select spread several months, and there's an additional $10 premium for prime cattle. So the reality of it is that the industry is moving away from looking at merely a low choice animal versus a select animal and going to that animal that is in the upper two-thirds of choice or prime. If your, feed, if your costs for feeder calf are the same, or two calves, and one of them can hit up or two-thirds choice versus another one being low choice on an 800-pound carcass with a 20-cent slide, that's $160 more in order to be able to hit that prime or the upper two-thirds. So we really are focusing on that. And in order to do that, one thing I'm going to try to stress today is maintaining consistency of feed intake. And I want to set this stage right now before we go further. One of the biggest mistakes that cattle feeders make, especially cattle feeders who are not feeding thousands of cattle a year, is we get too excited about getting cattle on feed too quickly. And then once they are on a diet, we bump them up too quickly. I am perfectly fine if a pen of cattle eat exactly the same for a month as long as the diet is formulated correctly and the feed bunk score is that of a one half. And I'm going to show you that feed bunk score later and show you what it looks like. I like to start off with a little bit of chemistry because I think that oftentimes we forget that cattle feeding really goes back to chemistry and economics. This is a picture of the sugar glucose. Starch and cellulose are both made of glucose. The only difference between starch and cellulose is the way that it is bonded together. On the top, this is an alpha-1-4 bond for starch. Pigs, cattle, dogs, cats, people, we can all digest starch. This is a beta-1-4 bond. This is from cellulose. We cannot digest cellulose. The rumen bacteria in cattle can digest cellulose. That's why they can eat grass. For people, if we go to a doctor and they tell us to lose weight, 
They put us on feeds that are high in cellulose, like lettuce, celery. Little practical thing here. If you have to choose between lettuce or celery, pick celery. Turn it over, fill it with peanut butter, enjoy it. You're not going to lose weight, but it tastes a lot better. Okay, this is an important slide. These are the volatile fatty acids that are produced in the rumen across all diets. They are acetate, propionate, and butyrate. There are a lot of others, but these are the three major ones. Pro butyrate's always around 10%. I want to focus on acetate and propionate. If I feed a 100% forage diet, I get about 70% acetate. I get about 16% propionate. If I go down to a high grain diet, 80% grain, I get about 50% acetate and about 30% propionate. Two things I want you to remember from this. No matter what the diet is, I'm always going to have at least 50% acetate. And as I increase grain from an all forage diet to a high grain diet, propionate doubles. The reason I remember that is because of the way they're used. Acetate only goes three places, back fat, seam fat, or milk fat. So, very little acetate is used for intramuscular fat or marbling. So if you've got grass cattle that are out there, and let's say you're backgrounding cattle and you're putting them in the feedlot at 850 pounds and you bought them at 500 pounds and they bit out on grass to put on that gain, 70% of the VFAs on that pasture are going to acetate. They put on back fat and seam fat. They're not depositing much marbling at all during that period of time. So my family used to background cattle for feedlots 35 years ago. And feedlots at that time, they liked cattle coming off in October as nice, fleshy cattle. Well, the industry has moved away from that time period. The problem with those nice, fleshy cattle going into the feedlot as long yearlings is that they probably contained about four-tenths of an inch of back fat. Four-tenths of an inch of back fat already gives you a preliminary yield grade of three. So you're never going to get a yield grade one or a yield grade two animal out of a fleshy animal going into the feedlot. That's the reason that the feedlot industry has moved to feeding calves, because they have less time with an acetate fermentation, and so we put on less back fat, and we can actually, it's not so much about receiving premiums, we don't want them to hit six-tenths of an inch of back fat, because at six-tenths of an inch of back fat, that's a preliminary yield grade of four. And depending on the grid you're marketing on, the discount for a yield grade four is between 20 and 25 cents a pound. So if you have a yield grade four high choice and your premium for that high choice is 20 cents a pound, but your discount for the yield grade four is 20 cents a pound, You've put a lot of feed into an animal, and the price you receive is the same as you would for a low-choice animal. Your discount and your premium both are about $160. Okay. Propionate. Remember that as we go from a forage diet to a high-grain diet, propionate doubled in that thing from about 16% to about 31%. Propionate is the only VFA that goes to glucose in the liver. Acetate cannot go to glucose, okay? Two propionate molecules form in the liver to produce one glucose, and when I get more propionate, I get a higher average daily gain, I get more feed efficiency, and 70 to 80% of the carbon backbone of marbling comes from propionate, so I increase my marbling. So the reason I show you that slide of acetate and propionate is so that you understand that we are going for propionate and away from acetate. Now, I want to ask a question. How many of you have cows at home? Okay. For everyone that has cows, not feedlot animals, everything I just said is a lie. Because a cow is a totally different thing. 
And this time of year, when you have cows, you want to do everything you can to increase acetate fermentation because for that newborn calf that may be getting born in February or March, you don't want to have that cow thin and be giving her grain because she'll get more propionate, and that propionate goes to glucose, and that increases calf birth weight. But more than that, the other thing that it does is it increases milk yield. And when I'm giving grain to a pregnant cow in the last stages of pregnancy through early lactation, now she's producing more milk on a newborn calf, and that milk has less back fat. Back fat is increased by acetate. So I have a message, and it's a very clear one. Save corn for the feedlots. Do not be using corn on cow herds. If you're going to have to add energy to a cow herd, use something like pelleted soy hulls that are cellulose that will not alter the amount of propionate. If you're trying to get energy into your cows because they're thin this time of year, grain, if they're calving in the spring, grain's the wrong way to go. So, we're in a feedlot situation here. Going back to the feedlots, we're trying to use propionate. And as I said, propionate is the only BFA that goes to glucose in the liver. It results in more average daily gain, more lean tissue growth, and more intramuscular fat. Now, I want to back up and just say one thing. If you listen to the news, you will be convinced that all of our feedlots are destroying the planet with all of the greenhouse gases. On a forage-based diet, acetate does not turn to glucose. The way that cattle get rid of acetate is that the carbon is split off, it combines with a hydrogen, you get methane, you get rid of CO2, and there's a harsh reality out here. Greenhouse gases are produced more in the production of a pound of meat from a grass-fed animal than from a grain-fed animal. Now, I have one more thing to say about that. People like two-minute video clips or less. And we have forgotten that before we put trains across this country, there were 50 to 80 million bison. Those bison weighed a lot more than our imaginary 1,200-pound cow that's really probably closer to 1,400. But those bison were 18 to 2,200 pounds. They were ruminants. They ate 2% of their body weight just the same as a cow. So we have 96 million cows or we have 80 million bison. Here's a reality. Methane, carbon dioxide, they've been produced by ruminants in North America for eons. I want you to have that little bit of background information. You can look it up online. There's a fellow out of Cornell by the name of Herstov who has done a lot of work on this. Just understand that we only look historically at what's happened in the last 10 minutes. Ruminants have been here for tens of thousands of years. Okay. I also want to get into this because, as I said the very first thing, the goal of a feedlot is to maximize efficiency. The fewest pounds of feed per pound of gain. Well, you need to understand not all average daily gain is the same. The visceral organs, the rumen reticulum, mummy, some abome, some small intestine, large intestine, liver and kidney, they take 50% of the daily calories that animal consumes just to maintain them. And there is a hierarchy of nutrient use that goes maintenance, development, growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. Those organs, just those organs, take half the energy and 35 to 40 percent of the protein. Those organs increase as the forage content of the diet or the forage particle size increases. In a feedlot situation where our goal is to maximize feed efficiency, and I'll show you this later, but I want to say it a few times so you remember, we don't want a forage particle size longer than an inch in a feedlot diet. We want that gut to shrink down. 
Another reason the feedlot industry has gone to more calf feds versus yearling feds is because we have a lot of research out there all, that also shows that if I bring a calf in that's been backgrounded for 90 days and has a big gut, it takes six weeks to shrink that gut when I move it to a higher grain diet, but that animal still, for the last 150 days of its feeding period, is going to be 21% less efficient than if it never had that long stem forage. The feedlot industry has a lot of data that we use to know what kind of cattle we buy. Now, we're in Ohio, where show ring's pretty big. If any of you show steers out there and you feed some long hay, you'll get a nice deep belly. It won't mean a thing. But it's kind of funny to me that sometimes the show ring goes for things that they view as magically important that have nothing to do with economics of the feedlot industry or food production. And it's okay, I've clipped a lot of cattle in my life. I feel comfortable saying that. Okay, I remind you of this. On a high grain diet, 70% acetate, 16% propionate. On a high, high, I'm sorry, high forage. On a high grain diet, acetate still 50%. Okay, so how do we increase the proportion of propionate? We can increase the rate of passage by processing feed to reduce particle size. I'm going to tell you right now, the feed that we want to reduce particle size of is forage and probably not corn because of acidosis that I'll get into in a minute. We can increase the rate of fermentation by feeding more grain. In the United States, we can also feed ionophores, such as menensin or bovitec, and they select against the bacteria in the rumen that produce acetate. They shift the rumen population of bacteria towards more propionate producers. Now, the downside is, if you're feeding for an all-natural market, ionophores are a class of antibiotics. So never ever programs and non-antibiotic programs really don't want them. But 95% of the cattle that are fed in the United States are fed in ionophore and in feedlots for mensins, by far the most common one. I have a lot of gray hair. I worked for 35 years in beef cattle research, feedlot research here at Ohio State. When I started, we used to feed 200 milligrams per head per day of remensin and we'd get a 7 to 8% improvement in response in feed efficiency. Then we went up and we started feeding 250 to 300 milligrams about 10 or 15 years ago, and we'd get a 5 or 6% response. Now we're feeding 350 to 400 milligrams and getting a 4 to maybe 5% response. We call that antibiotic resistance. And the reason is that because about 15 years ago, rumensin got cleared for use in cow-calf formulations. And when we took it from purely the feedlot back to the cow-calf sector, and those calves ate the feed that had rumensin in it, they got exposed to it as calves. So by the time they get to the feedlot, they've been on it a lot longer. Let's keep that in mind. Okay, so now I, I was asked to talk about small grains, so I need to go over grains and particle sizes. Karen Bucheman up in Canada back 26 years ago did a great study. She looked at corn, barley, or wheat fed separately as whole, unprocessed grains in 100% concentrate diets fed twice daily. Corn resulted in 1,012 Jews versus barley at 750, wheat at 790. And she looked at rumination time. The moral of this research was that small grains need to be processed in order to be fed and utilized because they are small enough to pass out of the rumen undigested. Grain from corn grain is broken down. Now, younger animals chew their grain. Older animals, older cows, if you go out to give corn to an older cow, she gulps it. Younger animals chew it. Personally, 
I feed whole corn diets to everything up to about 15 to 16 months of age because by the time it hits the rumen, it's broken apart. And I want to lengthen my rate of digestion to as many hours as possible rather than giving a finely processed grain. So let me ask the question some of you are thinking, yeah, but when I look in the manure of that whole corn diet, I can see whole kernels of corn. We did about 20 years worth of research looking at starch digestibility of corn with various processing levels. And at 20 pounds of corn, a steer's getting about 22,000 kernels of corn. You can see 220 kernels, and that's still only 1%. You can't see the small particles of starch from the ground corn. Whole corn's digested about 95% if you keep the fiber level down below 15%. Ground corn is digested to about 97, 98%. So starch is about 80% of a corn kernel. If you look at it on a small scale, if you're feeding less than 10,000 head of cattle, if you're feeding a couple hundred head of cattle, that three percentage difference in digestibility doesn't pay for your labor, your transportation, your cost per ton of feed to grind it, and then the additional chance of acidosis. I'm going to talk about some other things. But the bottom line is small grains need to be processed. Corn really doesn't. Yes. Actually, we've done, I've done a lot of feeding of distillers with whole corn. And if the bunk is managed properly, they will clean up the distillers. If they're not cleaning it up, they're probably being fed just a little too much. If they're what? If they're on a flex auger feeder? The reality of it is that I'm still going to go back and say it's bunk management. Cattle sort, we don't think that cattle sort. If you're feeding distillers that's already a really small particle size and you process the corn, when I get to the section here looking at manure, look at it closely to see about acidosis. If we look at the rate of starch digestion of the various grains, wheat and barley are the fastest. It's because the grains are small, but more importantly, bacteria attach to the feed particle in order to digest them. The starch in granules that are inside of wheat and barley are much smaller than the starch granules inside of corn, not the grain themselves. If I put it on a relative scale and a starch granule of wheat and barley were the size of a ping pong ball, the starch granule and corn would be about a baseball or softball size. So you put tens of thousands of starch granules in there, there is a lot more surface area with small grains, which means it's digested faster. Next is high moisture corn. And I'm going to show you some data later of the why I don't like high moisture corn. High moisture corn is great in large feedlots that have a lot of corn to put up in a short amount of time and don't have bins and they pack them into huge bunkers and mounds and it stores but you lose 10 percent of the energy in the corn getting the fermentation to occur and so i'm not wild about it Steam flake corn is a great feed. It's right in the middle, followed by dry rolled corn, dry whole corn, and dry rolled grain sorghum. These slowest digested feeds, they have the least risk of acidosis. So, I'm going to jump through this and just tell you without making you read it. Roughage particles in a feedlot diet should be less than an inch. If you have a round bale, in a feedlot with a steer stuffer, and you're doing that because 
you work off farm, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. But I am going to tell you that's not the most efficient way to utilize the grain. And I will tell you that if you're doing that and you have the ability to buy hay that is from a chop cut baler that goes in at five inches versus a regular round baler that has a particle size this year for first cutting hay of somewhere between here and here, depending on whether you got in your field in late June or August. In August, you probably had some nice regrowth occurring. But the reality of it is, we want small particles. The other side of this is, and this is a really good study, it looked at what type of roughage source makes the most sense in cattle finishing diets. And they looked at chopped alfalfa, which was 40% NDF. I apologize, I forgot to change this. I used this slide in Argentina, and they call it FDN, not NDF, and I forgot to change it back. But alfalfa hay has 40% NDF, chopped Sudan, 66%, wheat straw, 80, cotton hulls, 86. The results were that the effective roughage source in the rumen is a direct result of the NDF concentration. What's all that mean? What it means is, on a high grain diet, rumen pH is low. Forage isn't digested below a pH of 6. Many of our feedlot diets are below a pH of 6 several hours a day. I would rather feed chopped straw than any hay. And the reason I would rather feed chopped straw is, if I have chopped straw, or if I have some sort of haul, cotton seed hauls, we have used peanut hauls, if I have something that has a lot of lignin, I don't need to feed 10% of the diet like I do if I'm feeding hay. I can feed 5% of the diet. And that leaves me 5% more diet for corn. The average forage level in finishing diets in the commercial feedlot industry is between 6 and 6.5% 6 and forage. Very low levels of forage. That forage is only used to stimulate the rumen papillae to keep them healthy. Because those papillae in the rumen, I'll show you a picture, that's where the VFAs are absorbed. We want to keep them healthy. This is a picture of Keep in mind this starch digestibility. Show one thing. Notice that the lowest level I ever get is about a pH of 5. This is what happens with acidosis. It starts out at okay at around six and a half, but it drops down really low if they overeat, and it goes down to about four and a half and it comes back up. Here's the problem with this with acidosis, and this occurs with really finely ground feed or with feed bunks that aren't properly managed. Animals undereat and they overeat, and they undereat and they overeat. And the days that they overeat, this happens and pH goes really low. Well, there's a message here. This pH, it's a measure of the hydrogen ions, acid-producing units in the rumen. pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, and it's on a base 10 scale. And all that fancy stuff just means at a pH of 7, it's neutral. At a pH of 6, there are 10 times more hydrogen ions than at a pH of 7. At a pH of 5, there are 100 times more hydrogen ions than a pH of 7 because it's 10 times 10. And if you have a dairy nutritionist who is helping you formulate your feedlot diets and they are adding bicarb to help buffer the room and pH in a feedlot, don't waste your money. Bicarb works on dairy diets where the pH runs somewhere between 6.5 and, and 7 because it's forage, not grain. On a grain diet, because it drops so much lower, we did some calculations 20 years ago and found out that to really buffer the pH of a steer eating 20 pounds, you'd have to feed them about 4 pounds of bicarb per day. It is a very weak buffer. Saliva is much better. So, 
I'm going to show you some real pictures from animals that were harvested here at the meat lab at OSU. These came from a, a producer that had cattle that had severe acidosis. It was a, a heavily processed feed. And it's pretty liquid. There's not many particles there. This is what the rumen looked like. These should all be individual. This is matted. It looks like a carpet. This was clumped together. There was no fiber in here to act as a scratch factor to keep them cleared out and the, the papillae clump. Well, the problem with this is when it's clumped, because there's no fiber, those papillae basically stick together. Those papillae need to be separate because it's the surface area of the papillae that allow for the absorption of the VFAs. When those VFAs, they are acids, when they can't be absorbed, the pH of the rumen drops. These are hair follicles embedded in the rumen wall. That leads to local abscesses. It leads to increases in liver abscesses. It is not good animal welfare. It's very difficult to control once it happens. If you go into a feedlot and they are feeding a very low forage diet and you see cattle licking each other, not just a couple, but in feedlots where they're really slick, they either have acidosis because the bunk management is poor or they don't have enough fiber in their diet. They're doing that in confinement because they can't eat dirt. These are the hairballs that we took out of that one particular animal. We had to cut them apart with a saw. Hairballs are tightly packed. Okay, that is absolutely an abnormal situation. So, <clears throat> when we look at grain processing and cattle feed intake patterns, we are concerned about things like particle size, particle shape, the density of the feed, how much water the feed can retain, the charge in the feed, and do the particles hold together? Do they adhere? One of the beautiful things about the Midwest is that we have the ability to grow corn silage. I love corn silage because it allows us in growing diets or in 10% in a finishing diet, good quality corn silage is half corn and half roughage on a dry matter basis. It allows us to put our minerals directly into the feed bunk rather than having to feed them free choice. It allows us to feed distillers grains and corn gluten feed and other things with real soybean meal with real small particle sizes and get them to adhere. It, it is a really good thing to have in our feedlots. So let's look at some of the typical sorts of situations that we get here. This is a picture of whole shelled corn. This is really good up to 10 to 15% fiber in the feedlot diet. This is coarsely cracked corn. It's good to about the same range. I want you to look at this picture. I would not want to feed corn to a steer any finer than this, ever. That is the max grind that I want. These two were drier coming out of the field. These two. Starch is a crystalline structure. Imagine that you've got a crystal glass, a real crystal glass, and you drop it, and it hits concrete. It shatters. So does starch when it's ground. If you have a wet year, and you are harvesting, and your corn needs to be dried down more, you have a much greater risk of acidosis from grinding than you do with corn that dries down naturally in the field because of this type of shatter that occurs. This is one reason from a safety standpoint that I feed whole shelled corn because that same kind of shatter occurs in the mouth of a calf up to 15, 16 months of age. By the time it hits the room and it is coarsely ground. I want to 
Steam flake corn is wonderful. Steam flake corn is a great feed because it's very consistent. Now there's a difference between steam flake corn and whole shelled corn. Steam flake corn is about 99% digested in the rumen. Whole corn, maybe 85 to 90% digested in the rumen. Well, this is where this gets interesting. If you look at CAB's <clears throat> quality grades over the last 15 years, and you look at regions of the country that have the highest grading cattle, it's not the commercial feedlots using steam flakers in the southwest. It's the more northern, more eastern feeders that are using less processing because 15 to 20 percent of the carbon backbone from intramuscular fat for marbling come from starch absorbed in the small intestine. And you get some starch bypassing to the small intestine with ground corn or whole corn, but steam flake corn has been gelatinized by the steam and it's very available to the rumen bacteria and nearly no starch gets to the small intestine. So there are things we keep in mind. Now I want you to look at manure. This picture of manure is only high because there's a lot of fiber in that manure to hold it up. This is very typical, very appropriate manure in a feedlot. There is no water. You can see a little bit of corn, but it's pasty. There's no water. It's not being held up because it's a low fiber diet, but we're running into problems until we get here. If you get here, you can see some slimy stuff that looks like mucus. If you look here, there's water pooling. This is watery diarrhea. The mucus stuff is the lining of the small intestine and the large intestine from cattle that have acidosis. And what happens is when the rumen pH goes too low, all the way down that digestive tract, that feed has a lower pH. And in the small intestine where the pH is supposed to be about a four, it goes down to a three where it ought to be in the abomasum. And the lining of the intestine starts to slough off. We really want to avoid these situations. This is a picture of cattle in a feedlot eating dirt. It's called pica. This is what happens with cattle licking each other in confinement that are on concrete that don't have dirt. They have acidosis. It's an abnormal situation. They are trying to eat something to help cure their acidosis. Very bad situation. And you can see that it's severe because they're lined up doing this. Okay, so acidosis comes from highly processed grains. One of the major culprits is an organism called Streptococcus bovis that produces lactic acid. The generation time of that bacteria is about six minutes. The generation time of most of the bacteria that produce propionate is about 30 minutes. So when you get an abnormal fermentation going, there can be five generations of these lactic acid producers to one generation of the propionate producers, and that's what large lactic acid load. The cattle become listless, they get diarrhea, they go off feed. <clears throat> we get bloat as a byproduct of acidosis often. I just want to say one thing about this real quickly. I go into a lot of smaller feedlots and I've seen it a lot and people that don't feed a lot of cattle won't have a regular stomach tube, a real stomach tube. What they'll do when they have an animal that bloats is they'll find their oldest garden hose and they'll get a pocket knife and they'll cut it off and they'll stomach tube the animal. And that garden hose, if you don't heat it and you don't round those edges and you put it down the animal's esophagus, at the bottom of the esophagus is a valve. It's a sphincter valve. And when that sharp edge hits that, it causes just a little abrasion. And when that gets a little bit inflamed because it's under an acid load all the time in the room and the next time 
that little abrasion is bigger in its wealth. So I do have something to ask. If you are not set up for dealing with this, if that happens, if you've got a good large animal veterinarian, get a trocar. Get them to come punch a hole in the side that will heal because I see many chronic bloaters that people stomach tube for two or three days, they end up killing them because they've caused swelling in that little valve that cannot heal because it's under an acid load and, and you've created a problem. Okay, I want to talk about bunk management. Bunk, bunk management is the way to prevent acid bloat. Bunk management <clears throat> involves several things. It involves increasing the frequency of feeding. It involves really gradual diet adaptations. Sometimes it involves feeding complementary grain sources like partial whole shelled corn, partial ground. Keep in mind, it is more critical with the small grains than the least critical with whole shelled corn, but it's still critical just a relative thing. I love bunk management because it allows me to control feed delivery. It reduces human error, it reduces feed wastage, reduces metabolic disorders. Can be used if we limit them a little bit to reduce excessive fatness and it improves feed efficiency because cattle come to the feed bunk when you feed them. I'll show pictures and how this works. So feed bunk management does three things. It maximizes animal performance, it minimizes digestive disorders, but more importantly, it keeps animals eating a consistent amount of feed, and that's critical. And there are a lot of systems out there. I like this one that goes from zero to four. Going for this. They were going for this about 30, 40% of the time were this. It's available, they were going for this. Now let me information. In this study, if it snowed or there was a weather event that caused that feed to get wet, they went out and they weighed back the feed in the lot B group and they replaced it with an equivalent amount of feed so that the feed wasn't just sitting there stale. Okay, this was a really intensive study from that standpoint. Here's what they found. Lot A controlled intake versus lot B. There was no difference in feed intake over their 150 day feeding period. But average daily gain under the controlled situation was 3.76 pounds of feed per day versus 2.07. It took 5.38 pounds of feed to put on a pound of gain controlling intake, but in lot B it took 9.47. If you're marketing grain through cattle, would you rather be marketing in lot A or lot B? You better like A. Fewer pounds of feed per pound of gain. How can this be? With lot B, there is always feed available. How can that be bad? It doesn't make sense. Until you look at feed intake patterns. When I said if I had cattle that could eat the same intake all the time and I didn't have to adjust it, I would be really happy. It's because 80% of feed intake in ruminants total goes to maintenance. Only about 20% of our feed goes to actual gain. So on an average of 20 pounds over this 55 day period, 80% percent of 20 is 16. That comes in about right here. After those first four days getting on to feed, what percentage of days are they above 16 pounds? All of them. Now, down here, by the way, <clears throat> how many of you think the weather in Ohio is consistent? Okay. Huh? Consistently bad. You know, I love November in Ohio. I really miss November. Moving to Georgia, I miss not knowing whether it's going to be 70 or 30 from Tuesday to Wednesday. That really frustrates me. I'm getting used to sunshine, but the weather consistency is really troubling. 
Okay, here's what happens. On this day one, with plenty of feed, these steers thought it was Thanksgiving. There was more mashed potatoes there than they could hardly look at, but they ate everything. And the next day they had a bellyache. They were acidic. So they're not hungry that day. The problem is, here's maintenance requirements. All the days under my pointer, they're not meeting their maintenance requirements, which is why it took 9.5 pounds of feed per pound to gain versus 5.4. <clears throat> the goal is to keep consistent intake. Now, how many of you are from a large family? More than three brothers and sisters. Okay. For those of you who are from a large family, if you were the slow eater of the kids, were you the heaviest or the lightest? Yeah, you're the lightest. Same philosophy works with steers. When you feed to just enough feed that they're clearing it up in 23 to 24 hours, when the feed truck comes through, they come to the bunk. They come in waves, but they come. When feed's always there, there is no fear that feed will not be there tomorrow or in six hours. And it causes this overeating and undereating. And this is what we want to avoid. So why was the feed efficiency improved with good bunk management? <clears throat> we reduced maintenance requirements because we reduced stress. We reduced acidosis, so we reduced stress. There was more energy left over, and every day they ate in of their maintenance requirements. We have to keep in mind that we can control how cattle eat. Now, if that bunk were slicked two days in a row and the cattle were nervous, I would not increase feed by more than half a pound per head per day. And I would do that if I'm feeding twice a day by increasing it a quarter pound per head in the morning and a quarter pound in the evening. And then I wouldn't mess around for two more days. I bring them up really slowly, even if I think they're being a little bit underfed because I don't want to create that period where I give them too much and they drop. When you're working with large commercial feedlots, crashes occur when cattle are increased two days in a row, even relatively small increases, because that second day, some cattle overeat. And the next day, there are hungry cattle from that prior day and they overeat and then the whole pen crashes about day three. We want consistency. Okay, so I want to talk real briefly about some feed additives to improve performance. In conventional feedlots, we use remensin to reduce lactic acid production. We can feed Amifirm or Levucel SC to increase the bacteria that utilize lactic acid. Well, here's the deal. You can't use remensin on an all-natural program. If you're feeding a natural program, Amifirm or Levucel are great options. The difference is remensin's gonna cost you about a penny and a half per head per day. Amifirm's gonna cost you about six cents. There is a cost difference, but if you're feeding an all-natural program, it ought to work. Proper bunk management is actually a keystone of any feeding program. And we will, as I've said, we want to minimize feed fluctuations. Remensin works by decreasing intake. It also works by having the cattle come to the bunk about two more times per day. Without remensin, most cattle will come to the feedlot and at least have a feeding event. It might be five pounds, it might be a couple nibbles, between eight and 10 times a day. With remensin, that's increased to about 10 to 12. They don't really like the taste of remensin, but they're still hungry under good management. But because they're eating more meals, 
it's spread over more of the day. Because it increases propionate, they gain the same on, the sa on less feed, and you get an improvement in efficiency. With Amifirm, it does not reduce feed intake. It's either the same or it increases because you get an increase, gain is increased, and efficiency is therefore increased. Very different modes of action. Okay, I just want to let you know that there's a huge controversy about are ionophores an antibiotic or aren't they? And they are not supposed to be absorbed by the animal. And a lot of us have argued for a long time, well, because they're not absorbed, they're not an antibiotic. But nearly every non-antibiotic non program out there does not allow, allow ionophores because the science of them is that they are a class of antibiotics. They were developed as anti-coccidials in the poultry industry because coccidia are gram positives and it reduces gram positives. When I have ionophores, they decrease methane production, they decrease the heat of fermentation, they increase efficiency of feeding, and they spare amino acids for gluconeogenesis. If I'm feeding commercial cattle, not for an all-natural market, I want to have rumensin in that feedlot diet. Amifirm works by increasing Megaspherils deni, lactate utilizing bacteria, and it stabilizes rumen pH by having more acid uptake. I want to show this slide because I keep hearing from people, you can't feed all natural cattle as efficiently as you can commercial cattle. And we did a study at OSU, a couple of them looking at Amifirm and lambs, and got a 4.9% improvement in feed efficiency. And we used three grams of Amifirm in corn-based diets for 150 days versus no amifirm, we got a 7.2% improvement in feed efficiency. This was research sponsored by NCBA, looking at all natural programs. The amazing thing is, product aside, this 4.8 pounds of feed per pound of gain, that's the most efficient group of cattle that we fed here in 35 years of my being here in Worcester, working with Steve Lurch. And it was on an all natural program. So no one can tell me that we can't feed all natural cattle efficiently if we use good bunk management because we can. So my final thoughts on this portion of my presentation is that acidosis is preventable with proper bunk management, looking at feed particle size and forage levels. We can look at manure every day to evaluate whether we have diarrhea and what incidence of diarrhea. Nervous cattle, they're more susceptible to acidosis than calm cattle, feeding off of what Dr. Boyle said. In commercial feedlots where they may be walking cattle a quarter of a mile or a half mile to the chute to get an implant, it can take two to three weeks to get those cattle back up to the level of feed intake that they were the day before they were taken out of their pen and stressed and put back. Because when they come back in their pen, they're out for a few hours. Feedlot managers reduce the feed and bring them back very, very slowly, still trying to keep them above maintenance requirements and not pushing them so they don't crash. A nervous animal, and for those of you that are selling feeder cattle to a feeder, every year that you've got a good relationship established or that are feeding your own cattle. One nervous animal in a pen of 100 can reduce feed efficiency of the entire pen by 2 to 3%. That's a lot of feed loss. And here's how it works. We have personal spaces. Cattle have personal spaces. If this table were a feed bunk, the aggressive eaters come to the center. The next most aggressive eaters go out, and the least aggressive eaters go from side to side. Don't hit me. Okay, please. 
So, if I'm a nervous animal and I'm being bumped around and he's eating and I come in and go like this. Is this nervous? A little bit. Nervous for me too. Thanks for not hitting me. You want to avoid nervous cattle. Call based upon disposition. That's a really important thing. Okay. Finally, improper bunk management, feed delivery, and overly processed grains are the most common cause. Delivery and overly processed grains are the most common cause.